Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kristen Spindler. I'm the director of Incubator CTX at Concordia University, Texas. I'd like to welcome you to our Leadership Lunch series. Today, our topic is Sales Conversations, Selling During the Pandemic with Mark O'Brien. We're grateful to partner with Mark to bring you this Leadership Lunch webinar. Mark is a seasoned business development and sales executive who mentors companies at Incubator CTX. He's worked with startups and Fortune 10 companies. His talk today is going to focus on what motivates the customer, and his goal is to shorten the sales cycle. The format today is about 45 minutes as Mark takes us through his presentation. We'll leave 15 minutes at the end for a question and answer. If you're new to Zoom, you've got a button on the bottom of your screen that says chat. Um, and if you could, if you have a question, just type it in there. Um, Hannah and Ben um, and Elizabeth are going to be monitoring the chat. So if you do have questions, uh, we'll try to get those most pertinent questions answered during the call. And if there are still questions, we'll get back to you with the answers after the call. So with that, um, let's give a warm virtual welcome to Mark. And Mark, go ahead, take it away. Well, thank you very much, Kristen, for that introduction. Um, can everyone see my screen? Can you see the screen or do I need to do another screen here? Yes, we're getting some yeses on the chat. Okay. So um, anyway, my name is Mark O'Brien. Uh, I've been living in Austin for over 20 years. And uh, I'm here to talk to you about having sales conversations, especially during these trying, most trying times. Um, it's really all about having the right sales conversation at the right time. And uh, the reason why I've got uh, this, uh, this image up here is that I'm a, a trimaran sailor and uh, on Lake Austin with Austin Yacht Club and uh, have done national and North American regattas as well too and offshore. And um, I'm going to use some sailing analogies because even people who are good sailors, um, when they start racing, um, and just the same as uh, any of you have experience with uh, powerboat racing or, um, you know, car racing, just any anytime you're trying to get machinery to go faster, that there's a, quite, a, quite a learning curve. And uh, people who are great sailors are, are not intuitive uh, uh, racers. In fact, they're, they're pretty bad at it in the beginning and they get better over time. So I want to try and shorten that cycle down. But first, a few words about me. Born in the Boston area. Um, I lived in Silicon Valley for 10 years um, in the late 80s and 90s, just before the, before the dot-com uh, era. And then I've lived in, um, uh, in Austin, like I said, since, since 19, 1999. My roles have always been as a sales or marketing or biz dev, uh, customer support, uh, functional, uh, functional area as an individual contributor, and then all the way up to um, senior vice president. So currently, I mentor um, here at, at Concordia, and also uh, Vandergrift High School um, has a startup uh, incubator practice for juniors and seniors. And um, back um, back in the in the early '80s, uh, MIT started something at the time called an Innovation Forum, and I was one of the charter members of the company, I, company the high tech company I was working for, and started that. And that that continues to this uh, to this day. Um, I'm really passionate about getting more women and minorities into technology. Um, I believe very much in STEAM, uh, which is STEM, but with art, because um, I think art is a very important part of our technology and startup uh, culture as well. Um, at one time, I was a part-time tutor in algebra and creative writing to at-risk teens. And um, as I said, I, I sell, sell at-risk trimorans, which means three hulls. Um, I'm also a pretty good tennis player and a green belt hiker. I've been to just about every green belt in Austin. Got an MBA from uh, Imide in Lausanne, Switzerland, and a bachelor degree from uh, UMass in economics and MIS management. And then also, um, I did, I've done a lot of work with partnerships and um, um, channel um, executive work, and um, got the top attendee award at, at uh, Darden for doing that. And also we did a, a business simulation 
award over a week, and I was on the winning team out of eight teams in uh, Ensayade, France. So who's going to benefit most from today? Um, first of all, if you like sailboat racing analogies, um, this would be a good, it's a good time, um, be a good time for you. Um, um, in this image, um, we we're uh, in the beginning of the uh, the beginning of the race, and the boat, the competitor's boat, is actually you're seeing the view from their boat, taking a picture of us being being behind uh, being behind them. Um, I personally like business to business uh, models and SaaS models uh, myself. I've worked for several different companies that that have been the majority of revenue from professional services emphasis. Um, I've done a little bit of B, B2C and consumer packaged goods, and really not me. Um, my, my goal today is to help you shorten the sales cycle and show you some techniques, some very basic techniques without being pushy. We love to buy, but we hate to be sold. And um, if there are any founders out there who are listening in who want to start closing now, then uh, please pay attention for the next few minutes. So uh, my first question to the team is, is where are you? There are four distinct sales um, startup phases. Um, at inception, obviously you have zero uh, revenue. And um, the, the mode there is the evangelist from zero to one million. Um, and then from one to five, you make it repeatable. So while, while, I'm looking, while we're looking at this, I want you to just tell us, are, you, are your revenues currently for your organization less than a million, one to five million, or greater than five million? We'll give this a few more, a few more seconds. Okay, it looks like we have uh, most people, 85, 86%, it's changing slightly, <laughs> who are less than 1 million. Okay, um, I'm gonna end the poll. And then I'm gonna share the results of the poll, like you said, Kristen. So the vast majority are, are really um, under a million. Um, and then some people are, you know, in one to five and, and greater than five. Um, the reason, the reason why this is important is that um, there are very, very distinct um, differences in the revenue. And when you're in one to 10 million or five to 20 million, which is more my, uh, my sweet spot, then it requires a different uh, different definition. So anyway, I'm just going to try and close this up. Um, and then, so I'm I'm more on the make it repeatable side there, where you have some revenue, but you're really looking to to um, to get down your your messaging and really have something that's repeatable and having revenue that is um, lower churn and more reliable. At 10 million. Then you're looking at um, what I, I would call I would call the sales executive Ms. Go Big, which is basically to scale, expand sales, expand partnerships. Um, you know, at this point, you're probably going to have more product line, a new product line, may have an acquisition or two to manage. At 40 million, you're looking at Mr. Dashboards, which is somebody from um, in, in the SaaS parlance, it's probably somebody from um, from um, you know from a big um, company, big startup company. Um, that has that has gone big and probably gone public, and that person is is going to take you from 40 million on. And it's really looking at metrics and dashboards. You get a very very at that point you get a very very mature um, onboarding for salespeople, and you kind of know pretty quickly whether they're going to uh, work out and be an advantage for you or not. So I'll take uh, more questions as we as we get along uh, into this. So. So start with the basics and you're going to go far. Um, since most of you, 87% on the call are going from pre-revenue, it's really up to you, the founder. And, and I mean that, I mean, the founder herself, himself has got to take responsibility for revenue and for the first couple of customers or a, a trusted business co-founder. It could be the technical founder or the business founder. I've seen technical people be very, very effective in sales and introverts. Um, very effective in sales um, and, and sales situations, but you have to understand what what's going on here. There's a pandemic going on, and and the pandemic is going to really start affecting business in the second quarter. Um, Wall Street has been very very 
um, sufficiently warned. Uh, Disney's profits were off 90% yesterday when they reported earnings. They don't know when the parks are going to reopen. So in this environment, you're not going to get a second chance to uh, make a solid impact with a, um, you know, you know, with a, uh, with a prospect. So start the conversation with a simple question. And, and I'm just going to just, you can just copy this verbatim. I talked to, I talked to many people. Some organizations are currently hunkering down and, and surviving by freezing spending. Other organizations have gone through tough times before. They're looking strategically to grow market share and uh, reduce costs or take away business from competitors. We're, we're on the pendulum as your organization. So it's a simple question. I call this technique is sailing your own race because if the, cust if the prospect says, oh, we're you know, gloom and doom and we're laying off people and, and it's permanent, we're gonna have to shutter, you know, shutter divisions, then the follow-up questions there are, okay, so um, you know, when, when, when you, after you've done that, you're gonna have to start spending money um, going on. I mean, there'll be a vaccine. There is light at the end of the tunnel. We don't know how long the tunnel is. Um, so you can go down that direction with, with people who are um, on the you know, negative or you know, we're, we're, we're cutting projects or slashing and burning. Um, if they say that they're looking strategically or, or um, you know, very ruffle shot approach to grow market share, then you go in the other direction and say, well, that's really interesting. I do have several customers who are um, in the same situation as you. And um, you know, what does that process look like? You know, how do you fast track something that looks really optimistic or when you see a competitor stumbling or uh, you know, a really good opportunity out there? Notice I haven't started talking about what is I'm selling. I haven't started talking about my company. I'm trying to learn and listen to hear more about what is in their head right now. What's their most important? Um, I asked this poll question at a webcast last month in front of about 90 attendees. And almost half of them said that they wanted to modernize their software systems, which was a shock to me because I've never seen it, that, that question poll more than 20% at any point. So I've been following up with people um, in my own work to make sure I understand what exactly they mean by that when they say that. So here's some more, here's some more stuff on basics. This is really the meat, of the meat of the presentation. You need to master the basics and you'll scale faster. Uh, I guarantee this. Um, it is not about your invention. It is about meeting customers' unmet needs. And you have to figure out that by asking them really penetrating, interesting questions that other sales uh, salespeople or other people are not asking to their business. Um, you can go downtown and, and go to uh, Founders Academy. And you'll have a 30 second, you know, they'll teach you um, for, for some money, you know, how to do a 30 second commercial. I, I believe that you need to tweak, tweak that 30 second commercial, whether it's you talking to an investor or a customer or a technical person that there's a slightly, you know, there's a slightly different interest in what they want to have. And you need to understand that, um, and you need to understand that difference. When you come across an objection, I don't have any budget. Um, my boss is working from home and um, she's really hard to get a hold of, whatever. Then I would say, well, let's pretend that that wasn't an obstacle anymore. Let's pretend that we had unlimited budget. Let's pretend that your, your manager was listening to this conversation. Um, how would that change your answer? Or how would you want to go forward if you didn't have that as, a, as an objection, as a problem? Um, and then there's another technique called acting, uh, acting like a dummy on purpose, which is just basically to get them to talk. So you say something really, really simple about, oh, um, you know, how important are your legacy applications that are over 20 years old to you? And they'll talk and they'll tell you, you're kind of buttering them up uh, and, and really playing, playing dumb with saying, well, I'm not sure, because some people want to get rid of their old applications and other people say, they're still making money. They're still making money for me. They still run custom reports. They still do all these Sarbanes-Oxley and all these other compliance things that we have. The goal on any conversation in sales is to get the prospect to talk up to 80% of the time. And I, I'm, I can hear people fainting and hitting the floor. Um, it's not about you talking 80% of the time. That, that is when you know, you're, just, you're just a rookie. Um, 
it, it is possible to do that. I, I, once in a while, I'll get to 80, but uh, I would say the majority of my calls, and I have had people listening to some of my prospecting calls, is they're talking at least 60 to 70%, two thirds, like one third, two thirds. And all you're doing is just saying, oh, that's really, that's really interesting you say that. You know, can you give me another detail about that? How long has this been a problem? Have you given it up on, on trying to fix it? You know, um, that's, that's called active listening. And um, there's roles on, uh, depending on which kind of sales, uh, whether you do Vito or Sandler or another technique, um, there's, a, there's a mode that you want to be in, which is a nurturing adult, where basically you want to understand that and you really care about what the customer is, uh, the prospect is saying to you. And, um, you know, you're not patronizing to them, but what you're doing is you're, you're asking them interesting questions about what's going on. Like if they say, well, you know, it might be possible to do a pilot or to do a trial, um, trial roam with you and don't ask and think that you know what their process is. You say, oh, so how would that look like? You know, does that process change because of the pandemic, because everyone's working from home? Um, you know, I have a banking prospect and when they had everybody working from home, they had no way of getting digital signatures because people were just used to walking in the office and, and moving paper around um, to another person's desk. And um, when they had to have legal documents signed and so forth, they, they had to go out and buy a digital um, signing, uh, you know, two-step authorization software package immediately. I've got another bank in, um, in Europe that has got a bunch of payroll protections and uh, we're working with them to, to basically rebuild, rebuild their system because they've got some, some really fundamental problems with it and they didn't understand what was going on and, and we're literally helping them um, to do that. So are they spending money on, on many other projects? Probably not, but it's all about you asking them questions to find out what's important on their mind and then if you can help them. And if you can't help them, don't be bashful about saying, no, uh, we're not for everybody. Um, you know, I'll keep you in mind. I'll, I'll still touch out and, and send you newsletters and send you other information, but you know, move on. When people tell you that they're not interested in now, they don't have the capacity now and promise you just get back to them and just keep them, keep them on your, your tickler file. You know, um, I always give and get and compromise. So when someone tells me, well, I could buy that if, uh, you know, if you give me a better price, and I'd say, well, I said, I can give you a better price if we can start sooner, um, it, you know, and just kind of work back and forth with them on that. But, but um, so that's interesting that you want to have, um, you know, a 10 day right of refusal. Um, you know, our standard, our standard is 30 days. Um, what, um, you know, what can we do to, to work through that so that you, you're, you're working the deal so that you've got something that is presentable to your, your management when you're, there, when you're, when you're ready, to, ready to go forward. And also you've asked those questions so that it's easier for them to, to say yes and want to go forward as well too. Um, I'll guarantee you when it gets to, to purchasing, they're going to throw something out there like a master services agreement or the mutual NDA or other things that, that, that had you asked that question earlier, they wouldn't be delaying them their ability to go forward and want to start doing work with you. Um, beware the information trap and the demo trap. And by that, I mean information. Um, they say, well, just send me the brochure or just send me that stuff and I'll, I'll do that. Um, I say, Hey, if, if I agree to send that to you, um, can we, can we set an appointment for a follow-up call? I'll just take 10 minutes of your time. We can re review the information and uh, right away we'll know whether, whether we're fit or not. Would that, would that work out for you? The demo trap is a, a demo is not a lecture. A demo is not your, your opportunity to teach the audience um, like you're at a university. It's an opportunity to learn about why the customers is, is doing the demo at that point and what's motivating them. Why now? Why not three months from now? Why not a year from now? What's going on today in your world that that you think that seeing a, a deeper look at the product or my solution is going to be helpful. Um, start small, but start somewhere. Um, I, I've seen uh, people sell, you know, one or two licenses into one department and then, um, you know, it's, it starts growing the deal. It's like, at that point, I'm, I'm a big fan of sell that deal for the two, to the, for the two licenses 
And then if they come back and they want a discount on some other things, you can, you can, you can answer that question at that time that they start buying more licenses or, or want to do, want to do more work. But, you know, it's much better. The, the bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And it's much better to have a small closed deal with a customer who's paying than um, waiting for the, the deal to get grown and, and having a, you know, a third level manager have to sign off on and so forth too. Um, and last, the earlier and the harder that you qualify, earlier in the process, the easier the close. Um, there's, there's a technique called having um, an upfront contract at the beginning of the, of the discussion, just like you say, hey, if today's my, um, you know, I'm, I'm doing this today. My, my upfront contract is uh, I'm, I'm here to have, have some conversations with you about sales. And, um, you know, and I hope that this is beneficial to you. So people ask me all the time about what books should they read. Um, there's, uh, I'm not a big fan of having too many books. When I learned to sail uh, years ago, my, um, the person who taught me was a very experienced sailor, been across the Atlantic several times. And he told me, he looked me in the eye one time and he said, there's a lot of sailors at the bottom of the sea who read too many books on sailing, um, meaning we have an adage in sailing saying there's time behind the tiller or behind the wheel. That's what you need. And same thing in driving is that you need time and experience in a variety of different situations and every day is different out there. So um, some things that I like, if I, if I could only read one book, I do like the um, selling to veto is something that's been around since the nineties, the very important top officer. And then there's also um, you can't teach a kid to ride a bike at a seminar. Um, that's by Sandler, uh, which I've gone, I've gone through Sandler and IBM and, and several other um, sales methodologies, but um, I, I do like that. There's a uh, SAS, uh, com. Jason Lemkin. Um, Jason sold EchoSign to Adobe. Um, my company used EchoSign for several years um, and a uh, really interesting company. I, and I didn't realize that until I started um, following Jason um, about how good he was. They're putting on a virtual conference at the end of this month. I would highly recommend people to put some investment in that. If you're in the SaaS business, um, they, it, it would be time very, very well spent for you. Um, there's another gentleman named uh, Thomas Tungas, who's a uh, Silicon Valley, uh, 3000 Sand Hill Road, um, Red, uh, Repoint Ventures, does VC Insights. He does really, really good metrics. He has really good uh, depth on on verticals, especially for software. It really focuses on software, a little bit of professional services too. Um, Sandler, I mentioned. And lastly, HubSpot um, is a social media platform that also has a um, CRM, um, a sister CRM um, platform. I was one of the first HubSpot users in, in Austin when we started having a, uh, you know, a user group. Um, um, I haven't seen it in, in a while since then, but Dharmesh Shah, um, I happened to meet um, through a mutual friend after he had graduated from MIT and started and they went public, uh, I think about six years ago. So, so um, I think these people have some pretty good, pretty good insight. The HubSpot has a daily uh, sales um, push um, email system that's really, um, I think that's really, really good. So thanks for your attention today. And uh, just remember that you have to seal your own race if you want to win. If you always copy what the other competitors are doing or, oh, this person's doing this or that, I'm gonna do that, you're, you're not gonna come in first. And in this, in this image, this is our competitor taking a picture of us as we sail off into the sunset and across the finish line, several minutes ahead of them.